situation in the Middle East has become an explosive powder keg which could easily spiral out of control and possibly end up in a horrific third world war. Now, it all started with the 7th October terror strike, mass terror strike by the Hamas into Israel. Uh, the Israelis have lost about 1,200 killed, almost 3,000 plus wounded and about 250 hostages taken, out of which about 100 plus have been released. But there are still about 140 hostages in the captivity of the Hamas. Now, uh, as a bit of context would be essential as we develop this theme, the simple fact is that Israel responded with very justifiable rage to this massive attack given Israel's very small population base. This was almost the equivalent of some 40,000 people killed in the United States or in India. And uh, quite obviously, Israel had to react. The key question now being asked is as to how come, despite the very sophisticated intelligence capabilities of the Mossad, how could the Israelis be so surprised? For the time being, this question has receded into the background as the people of Israel have all come together to sink all their differences and to fight the three H's, the Hamas, the Hezbollah, the Houthis first, uh, prevail upon them and only then get into the nitpicking on who went wrong where. But uh, there is a school of thought that perhaps the Mossad, which, which can listen into every mobile conversation inside Gaza, inside the West Bank, etc., uh, was possibly aware of it was possibly aware that this attack was coming, but they deliberately let it happen because uh, uh, it would perhaps, uh, you know, serve to unite the country, which was then, as we are all aware, there were serious internal conflict and dissensions related to the curtailing of the powers of the Supreme Court, etc. Uh, be that as it may, only time alone and Israeli sources will clarify what really happened and how this major intelligence failure, very catastrophic intelligence failure occurred. Uh, but uh, uh, in the meantime, Israel has gone out and retaliated very, very strongly. Uh, as we are aware, Israel first retaliated with a massive uh, week-long bom air bombardment campaign. Uh, it primarily went for the infrastructure of the Hamas. The aim was to try and locate the Hamas top leadership, neutralize the top leadership, uh, neutralize the uh, rocket uh, firing uh, bases, the rocket storage dumps, munition dumps, etc. Try and hit the uh, Hamas military capability and top political leadership very hard initially from the air. The Israelis have the Zahia doctrine, which was enunciated by the former chief of the general staff, uh, General Ezenkot, Gadi Ezenkot. And he felt that, uh, you know, uh, Israel must inflict heavy and punitive damage on the infrastructure of these hostile organizations like the Hamas or the Hezbollah so that it acts as a deterrent for them to kind of repeat these attacks in the future. And we have seen the almost near total destruction of even the civilian infrastructure in the Gaza Strip. Uh, after the initial air bombardment, uh, the uh, Israeli army had mobilized, 300,000 reservists had been called up, and they went first and they attacked northern Gaza, and they advised the population to flee to southern Gaza to avoid the, uh, you know, damage from the airstrikes and the military action. Uh, uh, despite that, there have been very heavy uh, uh, civilian collateral damage and casualties. And uh, as per the, milit uh, the, the medical association in Gaza, you know, the casualties are upwards of 23,000 Palestinian killed and about 50,000 or so have been wounded 
large proportion of which are supposed to be women and children. Uh, uh, the, these remain to be confirmed, but quite obviously the uh, collateral damage has been exceptionally heavy. Uh, they, they attacked northern Gaza first. Their tanks, Merkaba tanks went in and they did house by house searches to try and locate the tunnel networks uh, and also to locate the top leadership as also to go in for the rocket storage dumps, manufacturing sites, etc. There was a plan to flood these tunnels to flush out the, uh, 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 the top Hamas leadership which had taken shelter there. Unfortunately, most of these tunnels have been built below the hospitals, mosques, schools, etc. Uh, the diabolical purpose is that to induce or to force Israel to attack these and thereby gain the propaganda advantage, the advantage in the information war narrative that uh, uh, Israel is heartlessly attacking the, the hospitals, the schools and the mosques, etc. But under all of these, the Israelis have now shown uh, uh, photographic evidence that the, the tunnels uh, take off from these uh, hospitals and such uh, sites of humanitarian uh, damage potential. Uh, that is to give Israel a very bad name, a very bad press, and they have quite succeeded in this information warfare offensive, which has put a heavy amount of uh, pressure on the Israelis. What are the Israeli aims? Destruction of the military capability of Hamas, destruction of the political leadership of the Hamas, destruction so that it cannot function as a viable uh, functioning entity anymore and mount any future attacks on Israel. Uh, it's not so easy to achieve as we have seen that despite the heavy air bombardment, despite the ground action, the, the Hamas has been able to come up resurface and, you know, uh, launch occasional uh, shoot and scoot rocket strikes on Israel, on the Israeli population. And this has only forced Israel to carry on and lengthen its campaign, uh, getting very, very, very uh, hostile international press in the bargain. But I suppose uh, nobody who is in charge of security in Israel can afford to let up and uh, stop or go in for a ceasefire only to have more rocket attacks coming on the Israeli civilian population. So in the first phase, they went in for North Gaza. They have eliminated a number of top leaderships. They have captured a lot of Hamas fighters and uh, who are currently being, being interrogated severely to make them reveal the tunnel layout, the entrances of the tunnels, etc., based upon which repeat operations have been launched. Uh, then the Israelis shifted their emphasis to South Gaza and asked the population to move towards the coast and back towards northern Gaza. And uh, uh, there also uh, it involved very heavy street-to-street, uh, house-to-house fighting. And urban, uh, you know, terrain can be the nemesis of any army. Uh, operations here are extremely costly in terms of manpower and casualties and uh, very, very difficult. Uh, but Israel has doggedly persisted with these operations to try and destroy the military capability and the political viability of the Hamas organization. They have met with a great amount of success, but uh, nobody can say with certainty whether this capability has been wiped out fully and hence Israel is not prepared to go in for a ceasefire. The Americans are also now uh, pressing upon Israel to uh, go in for an early ceasefire to, uh, pre uh, to permit more uh, humanitarian aid and assistance to flow into the people of Gaza and that you can't, uh, you know, do collective punishment of the, uh, of the population of Gaza, of the Palestinian population per se. Uh, Israel has been adamant that it cannot uh, afford to, uh, you know, neglect its security, national security interests. It cannot afford to uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, go in for a pause 
before it has achieved its military objectives. However, under American pressure, it has now agreed that it is about to end the intensive operation phase, which they claim has now come to an end and that they will only now go in for selective pinpoint strikes as the Americans were insisting upon. That is the military situation as far as the Gaza-Hamas conflict is concerned. Uh, Israel may win the military conflict, but it has to be careful that it should not lose the information war at the global level. Uh, be that as it may, Israel is adamant that its uh, national security interests supersede uh, the interests of uh, psychological operations or the information warfare, and it will continue till its military objectives are achieved. Now, Iran is the primary antagonist of Israel in the Middle East. It has vowed that, uh, you know, they had vowed at one stage that they would wipe out Israel, destroy Israel as a functional entity per se. And uh, towards that end, they have supported the three H's, the Hamas in Gaza, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the Houthis in southern Yemen. Now, these three H's, along with the Shia militia in Iran and Syria, have been mounting pressure on Israel. Uh, the Hezbollah, uh, you know, they started uh, firing rockets and missiles on the northern border of Israel, forcing about Israel to evacuate about 70,000 of its civilian population from that region to save them from the missile and uh, rocket attacks anti-tank guided missiles, etc. They have been firing regularly across the northern border. Uh, the Houthis we will cover separately, but the fact of the matter is that America's greatest concern has been not to let the fighting in the Middle East escalate beyond the existing threshold. And to that extent, to deter any would-be escalators, uh, they have sent in two aircraft carrier battle groups and allied uh, naval armadas to try and deter Iran and any other, you know, hostile actor, state or non-state, especially the three H's, from trying to escalate the conflict. Their primary interest is in trying to deter the Hezbollah from launching a major offensive. If the Hezbollah attacks in northern uh, Israel, it could cause very heavy damage, cause very serious problems for Israel. It would prolong the war. And let's not forget that 300,000 Israeli citizens have been mobilized to fight. And that means that so much of their workforce is uh, off the factory floors. And to that extent, it clearly uh, puts a tremendous strain on the Israeli economy. The Houthis, as we all know, have started attacking the shipping in the Red Sea, in the Gulf of Aden, at the Bab al Mandez, very narrow straits. And that itself has caused, is causing a lot of financial problems, economic problems for Israel, not only Israel, for Saudi Arabia, other uh, Gulf states, and also globally. Because now the shipping companies have to route their entire traffic around the Cape of Good Hope, extends the voyage by 10 to 15 days and, you know, is adding thousands of dollars to every uh, container that has to be shipped uh, along these routes. Uh, so, uh, I do not see the world being able to sustain this for very long. But the fact is, there is still the very great danger of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this escalating out of control. Iran has so far been using its proxies. It, uh, we are not sure of the level of control it has over the Houthis or the Hezbollah or the Hamas, because the Hamas did not share their plans to attack Israel with the Iranians. That seems to be pretty obvious from the intelligence inputs coming out of even Israel so far. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, uh, there is a dangerous situation emerging in the Middle East. The Americans are already bogged down in Ukraine. Now they have their hands full with the, uh, the Middle East. And a lot of the ammunition that they were supplying, artillery ammunition, 
uh, primarily that they were supplying to Ukraine has now had to be diverted uh, to Israel. And to that effect, uh, Ukraine is feeling very badly uh, dumped or let down in its conflict with Russia, where it has taken very heavy losses, especially in the last year when the Russians activated their Sorvakin defense line. The, all the summer offensives and the uh, August offensives of the Ukraine army have been dismal failures, leading to very heavy casualties of men and equipment. There have been reports that uh, 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 Ukrainian unit commanders are refusing to launch attacks, which are, they deem suicidal because uh, there is just no breakthrough that is coming. And uh, Russia, on the contrary, is now has mobilized 300,000 men to man their defense line. They have mobilized about 270,000 more and with the help of which they could launch a major offensive come the month of uh, end January or even as early as February, uh, like they had attacked uh, in 2020. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, 2022 rather. And uh, so America has its uh, uh, head bogged down in the sand in Ukraine. Now the Middle East has erupted. America's biggest worry is that if the Middle East escalates beyond out of control, then America will have to divert a lot of resources to fighting Iran and which could detract from the effort that it is making to pivot to Asia. Because as we are aware, the elections have been held in Taiwan and uh, the DPP candidate has won, which has, uh, you know, incensed China very much because they were very keen not to have the DPP candidate win for a third time but it has because they deem them as separatists, etc. So could, the key question is, could China take advantage or try and take advantage of America's preoccupation in Ukraine and the Middle East to prepone its plans for attack oblique blockade of Taiwan? This could come as early as April, May or August this year when the tide and met conditions are right. So we will observe and the Americans have been saying that they haven't supplied any equipment to Ukraine. For example, the longer range HIMARS of 300 kilometer range, which they would require to use on the island chains of the Philippines and the island chains coming down from Japan to deal with uh, any Chinese escalation over the Taiwan contingency. So, if they are involved in a major shooting war in the Middle East, it would detract greatly from their capability to act against China if it invades or takes any lesser action against Taiwan. So, they are very keen to prevent escalation. Uh, so is Iran not very keen to get directly involved because it knows that it could be uh, suffer very catastrophic damage if it has to fight Israel and primarily the United States. So, Iran has also been pulling its punches. What we have seen is a kind of a tit for tat, uh, 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 low intensity kind of activity against one another, unconventional warfare against one another, uh, wherein we find that the Mossad has used the Kurdish uh, fighters to stage a bomb blast inside Iran. A hundred people were killed in Iran when they were commemorating the death of uh, General Osmani, the charismatic IRG Revolutionary Guards commander uh, who had been killed about in 2020. When they were, uh, they were commemorating his death anniversary, there was a major uh, bomb blast, IED blast, which has killed over a hundred Iranians. Then surprisingly, we find Pakistan stepping into the fray. Now, Pakistan Pakistan has been trying to claim leadership of, uh, you know, the Muslim Ummah uh, as, uh, as far as against uh, the sentiments against Israel are concerned. Uh, there were some Pakistani officers who were talking very loose of the, uh, what they could do to fight with Israel, etc. On, on behalf of the Palestinians. But uh, surprisingly, despite all this rhetoric, pro-Palestinian rhetoric, the Pakistani Army Chief, General Munir, 
He went to the United States for a five days visit. Of course, apart from meeting with the uh, top guns in the Pentagon, he also met Victoria Nuland. Now, Victoria Nuland is infamous for her role in the, uh, in the clandestine activities of the CIA in Ukraine. You know, Maidan, coup, etc., etc. She's supposed to have been involved to a very great extent directing those kind of uh, clandestine operations. So, uh, we were baffled as to why General uh, Asif Munir, uh, you know, uh, had to meet Victoria Newland in the United States. The purpose now seems to be clear because the United States has then used Pakistan to mount pressure on Iran. And Pakistan has been using the Jundullah, now which is called the jaish e adal to stage terrorist strikes inside the Sistan Baluch region of Iran. A few days back, uh, the, the jaish e adal launched an attack on an uh, Iranian police station and killed 12 pretty senior Iranian police officials. So, Iran was stung by these uh, pinpricks. But, you know, which were directed against it, which were not of a level that would uh, impel it or force it to, you know, launch its massive uh, missile barrages. But Iran has reacted in a very precise and limited fashion by very precision missile strikes on the uh, 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 Mossad base in Ebril in Iraqi Kurdistan from where its intelligence indicated that the uh, attack on that, uh, uh, you know, the crowd in uh, that was commemorating the death anniversary of General Osmani, where a hundred Iranians were killed, had been originated. That one was hit. ISIS bases in Syria were hit. And also, they launched two, uh, uh, they, they launched multiple missile strikes on two jaish e adal camps inside Baluchistan, inside, deep inside Baluchistan and caused a fair amount of damage. The Pakistanis, of course, claimed that only two children had been killed, but that is their standard practice. Don't forget that when the Indian Air Force had struck Balakot, they had only claimed, uh, claimed that some crows had been killed, where the facts were quite otherwise. Uh, very substantial damage had been inflicted on the terror training camps which were located there. But the uh, Pakistanis tried to play it down initially. But the fact was that Pakistan had no option but to react because the Pakistani army is increasingly becoming unpopular, especially because it had thrown, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, uh, the Pakistani former prime minister uh, out of power uh, and uh, Imr uh, Imran Khan had been thrown out of power there. And uh, uh, it was interfering blatantly in Pakistani politics. Uh, through its efforts, now Imran Khan has been disenfranchised. He cannot take part in the next election. And if, uh, you know, they seem to be unable to control either the Baluchi terrorists, they are deep in trouble with the Taliban, which and its proxies, the Tehreek-e Taliban, Pakistan has been mounting very fierce attacks causing pretty heavy casualties inside Pakistan. So, the Pakistan army had to react to save its prestige with the people of Pakistan, its standing with the people of Pakistan. Uh, the Iranian attack came on the 16th of January. Uh, very precision missile strikes against two jaise adal bases. The Pakistani, you know, the Chinese radars of the Pakistani Air Force and the Army, etc., totally failed to, you know, uh, uh, give early warning of these missile attacks. And the Pakistanis have been cribbing to high heaven to the Chinese that their radars have failed them completely. But the fact of the matter is that the uh, Iranian missiles are pretty accurate and they have been very effective in being able to get through the air defenses of not only Pakistan, also the Americans in Syria and in Iraq. Right, and also uh, nothing could be done in uh, uh, you know the Ebril uh, province of uh, of of uh, Kurdistan in Iraq, and also in in Syria against the IAS, ISIS. 
they could not intercept any of the Iranian missiles. And these Iranian missiles are intermediate range ballistic missiles about 1400 to 1500 kilometers range and they have proved to be very accurate. So what Iran was trying to do was to send a very clear message to Israel, to the United States that it is capable of causing very, very heavy damage in case it is provoked. And the United States and Israel are both aware and they are not very keen to push Israel, uh, Iran to a point where it is compelled to fire off its uh, uh, missile, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very heavy uh, uh, arsenal of missiles. So the Pakistani military had absolutely no option not to react. But the simple fact of the matter is that they were in panic. The Pakistani Prime Minister, Prime Minister rushed back from Davos. The Pakistani Foreign Minister who was abroad visiting various countries, he also rushed back. Both uh, they withdrew their ambassadors from one another, the Iranians and the uh, Pakistanis. Especially the Pakistanis asked the Iranians to withdraw their ambassador. So something was cooking. 48 hours later, on the 18th of January, the Pakistani Air Force struck at 0600 hours in the morning. They used their J-10C Valiant Dragon Chinese aircraft as also the J-17 Thunder Dragon Chinese aircraft equipped with long-range precision guided missiles, standoff precision guided missiles. From their own side of the border, they used these missiles much in the way that India had struck in uh, Balakot. Uh, many years back and uh, uh, they targeted, uh, you know, uh, uh, 14 uh, uh, Iranian camps. Iran claimed that 14 camps were struck, but uh, the Pakistanis claimed that they targeted seven of the uh, camps of the Baluchi Liberation Army, the BLA insurgents, inside 60 kilometers inside Iran. Uh, they also used the Chinese Wing Lung 2. Uh, uh, unmanned aircraft, unmanned UAVs. Uh, possibly these were used to pick up the targets and then also perhaps to engage them. Uh, media, uh, you know, uh, uh, videos put out by the Pakistani ISPR, uh, Inter-Services Public Relations uh, uh, Organization, they showed rocket strikes also, but perhaps those were for deception. And uh, they were able to launch, I think, fairly successful attacks against these, uh, uh, these uh, 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 no, Baluchi Liberation Army camps 60 kilometers inside Iran. And the Iranian media said that nine people had been killed and scores other wounded. There were very clear uh, uh, um, uh, television, televised images of the damages that had been caused, both sides. The Pakistanis, of course, blanked out their media, blanked out any coverage of the attack sites of the Iranian missiles inside uh, Pakistan. Uh, thereafter, of course, the Chinese, who are very concerned because uh, they are very friendly with both Pakistan as well as Iran, and Iran, they have huge <coughs> economic stakes there because a lot of their oil, the bulk of it is now coming from Iran at very low cost, very low prices. They are investing heavily into Pakistan. They have invested already as part of their uh, Belt Road Initiative. Uh, and also they have in uh, high stakes, economic stakes in Iran. So they were very concerned that this should not escalate out of control because Iran had massed a lot of its forces for exercises. Normally it has been doing that against Pakistan. It shows, uh, um, I mean, it makes a great show of force or what is called coercive military deployments to deter Pakistan from such adventurism. But Pakistan appears to be playing the American game in this, surprisingly. Uh, the simple fact is that a lot of the Pakistani generals and senior army, navy, air force officials, they have their sons, their children studying in the United States, in the United Kingdom. And as such, they have a very uh, inherently pro-Western orientation, pro-American orientation, despite all the setbacks that they have had in their relationships because of their 
support to the Al Qaeda and to the Taliban in Pakistan in Afghanistan. Uh, they have uh, they have uh, they thought they had burned their bridges. The world thought they had burned their bridges with the United States, but apparently. Uh, you know, post Imran Khan, these have all been re-established and the Pakistani military is very keen to uh, now once again function as a cat's paw of the United States because it gets uh, weapons and munitions for free. Don't forget that uh, under American pressure, the Pakistani military has <coughs> also been supplying uh, 155 millimeter artillery ammunition to Ukraine. So, they have acted as a, an American cat's paw, but the fact of the matter is that it is China and it is Turkey which have both intervened very energetically to try and stop this, uh, uh, you know, from escalating further. It now appears that they have both decided to de-escalate and possibly we may not see further action barring the unforeseen, uh, at least on the Iran-Pakistan border. But uh, that still does not rule out escalation overall. The Houthis, which I shall be covering separately in another uh, episode, <coughs> however, have they have struck about 24 plus targets, uh, shipping targets in the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aden. They have been causing a lot of damage. The Americans warned them, but they would not desist. Then the Americans and the British they have launched massive strikes on the Houthi, uh, you know, uh, 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 tactical ballistic missiles, cruise missile, launch sides, launchers. They have hit their coastal radars. They have hit their command and control centers and their ammunition dumps. Uh, but uh, these have not been sufficient to deter. Despite these attacks, we found again the Houthis launching attacks on uh, American ships and vowing that uh, they would uh, make them pay a heavy price. The Americans and the British have again struck them in retaliation, their fifth attack really, but that hasn't uh, stopped. Let us not forget that for years, Saudi Arabia has been bombing the Houthis, but they have worked out their procedures, their SOPs, how to defend themselves against such attacks and how to go underground and safeguard their facilities. As it is, missile launchers can be easily moved after they fire. So, uh, it is, they are a mobile target, very, uh, very hard to hit precisely. And what we have seen is, and it was admitted by President Joe Biden himself, that uh, they have uh, not, the, the attacks so far, the Anglo-American attacks so far, have not been adequate to try and, uh, you know, to deter or to prevent the Houthis from striking shipping in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, the simple fact is that the global shipping companies have more or less stopped using this route. Uh, in between, Musk had started a few trial shipping runs, but after this escalation, they have stopped using the Red Sea route. The entire traffic is being rerouted around the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, which adds about 10 to 15 days to the voyage and adds thousands of dollars to the cost of each shipping, each and every container. So, no one is keen to see an escalation in the Middle East, least of all the Americans. The Iranians also know the cost that they would have to suffer in case it escalates out of control. But what form would such an escalation take? What would happen if there is some accident in their escalation control dynamics break down and we see, witness a major, major uh, escalation in the Middle East? What form could this take? This could take the form of massive Iranian attacks, missile and cruise missile and tactical ballistic missile attacks on Israel per se, on American facilities in Syria and Iraq and could lead to major, uh, you know, uh, escalation in the, in, the, in the scope and the scale of fighting in this region. Uh, Iran is a very uh, compact target, uh, very easy to defend. Iran has about 350 
very advanced jet fighters to be able to take down uh, the Iranian Air Force should it uh, make any attempts. The Iranian Air Force, most of its fighters are antiquated uh, F-4 phantoms of the uh, Vietnam War era, F-14 Tomcats. Then, of course, some Mirages. It's also gotten some Su-24s, etc. But uh, it'll have to fly across the territory of a number of other countries, especially Iraq, to be able to get to Iran. Uh, if it flies over uh, Iraq or Syria, it would have to contend for whatever air defenses there are, unless it has an agreement with them to allow this passage, which would have, of course, consequences for those countries. And uh, it's most likely to use its cruise missile and missile arsenal. So, let's uh, first uh, have a look at this cruise missile and missile arsenal. Uh, Iran has about 500 missiles, uh, cruise missiles, that is. These are called the Ya Ali cruise missiles of about 700 kilometers range. And then there are the ground launch cruise missiles of about 1,300, 1,200 to 300 kilometers range. Uh, this is a formidable arsenal of 500 missiles, pretty accurate. These are and difficult to detect or to this thing because they can do nap of the earth flying. Iran has about 3,000 missiles. Now, these include a, a whole arsenal of tactical ballistic missiles of five to 700 kilometers range. But what is most dangerous are the intermediate range ballistic missiles of the range of 1,500 to 1,700 and 2,000 kilometer range missiles. Most of them have a very big CEP of about 1,800 meters, but some of them this, this, this circular error of probability or the accuracy of these missiles has been vastly increased, possibly with Russian and Chinese help. And uh, they, were, they are also talking of uh, a CEP of, uh, you know, about 5 to 10 meters, which is, which is quite, uh, quite substantial in terms of accuracy of hitting out precise targets. And this capability has recently been demonstrated. Quite obviously, Iran was trying to demonstrate its capabilities to hit out at vast you know, distances in targets in Iraq and, and uh, in Syria, which implies that they were uh, able to fly up to 1,002 to 1,300 kilometers and uh, hit their targets with a fair amount of precision, fair amount of precision, uh, which is a uh, cause for concern. So, in case an escalation takes place and the United States and uh, Israel target uh, Iran, try and take out its nuclear facility, what would happen? Iran would retaliate with a rain of uh, cruise missiles, tactical ballistic missiles and intermediate range ballistic missiles on Israeli cities. Like I said, Israel is a very compact target, just about 250 kilometers in length and even uh, 50 odd kilometers in width. So, it is uh, quite easy to defend. Then Israel has a very potent air force of about uh, 350 top of the line fighters, which includes the F-35, American stealth fighters and of course F-16s and F-15s, uh, very, very lethal 4.5 generation fighters. Uh, whole lot of uh, beyond visual range uh, missiles, etc. It can take care of any air attacks uh, that may come, also to a limited extent, the missile attacks. For defense, it has got eight Patriot batteries, eight batteries of American Patriot missiles, which can shoot up to 150 kilometers. They can uh, take out targets at 150 kilometers. It has got three batteries of David Sling, uh, you know, uh, indigenous Israeli missiles, which have a range of about 160 kilometers. And it's got 10 Iron Dome batteries, which can take out targets at about 10 uh, kilometers, which they have been using very, very extensively against the bombardment by the uh, Hamas, as also by the bombardment by the, uh, by the uh, uh, Hezbollah. The fact of the matter is, if this could, if this flare-up takes place, it could cause very, very uh, substantial damage to Israel. 
and to American targets in the Middle East. Uh, so, are people prepared to go and accept that risk of this kind of an escalation? I have my doubts. What is even more which sort of uh, would lead to hesitation in terms of escalation is the fact that if an escalation takes place in the Middle East, it would tie down a heavy amount of American resources, at least two to four aircraft carriers, which would then not be available in case a flare-up takes place in Taiwan or the South China Sea. America is now clearly trying to pivot to Asia, pivot to face the Chinese. It is trying to now uh, shift the burden of the Ukraine issue more onto its European allies. It's trying to disengage from there. There were even reports that America to build up its strategic reserves of oil, which have been depleted because it gave them to Europe. It's even, there were some unconfirmed reports that it has been trying to buy cheap oil from Russia. So that just tells you that there is a paradigm shift possibly taking place in Ukraine. Ukraine will have to fight alone uh, and uh, uh, only with the help of the European Union.